If you go to churches today, you see somebody kneeling and dancing and singing, and you see Orthodox Jews that take live chickens and put them over their head. Just sure. like we have the Mormons. Have you heard this argument? Hey, baby, did you just fart? Because you blew me away. I know that one. <laughs> Believe it or not, it was over too much mayonnaise on his signs. There are many signs of the Day of Judgment that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, uh, told us about that are coming true in front of our eyes. Or maybe they have some leaders also who are, you know, promoting this. My daughter today texted me. She's in Minneapolis. She's 19. And she said, Mom, is, there, is this it? They all, came, they all came true. It wasn't like maybe five out of five. No, 100 out of 100. Wake up. There are over 300 million Americans that don't know what Islam is. This is why we are opening the Dean Center, the first of its kind, 35,000 square foot Dawah Center and Masjid to show America the beautiful message of Islam. Inshallah, with your help and donations, we can close on the property. Launch nationwide Dawah programs, a state-of-the-art production studio for online content, and an on-site Dawah center to show what true Islam is. Donate right now. May God Almighty Allah reward all of you. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, greetings of peace. Welcome to the Dean Show, which is a way of life. We try to put out there for everyone to see, helping you understand Islam and Muslims, which is, the, by the way, the most misunderstood way of life, yet the fastest growing way of life in the world. Even though there are billions being spent by the hate machine to keep you and humanity away from it. It's very easy to understand, very logical, evidence-based. And my next guest really likes to bring the evidence. And many times, even from the Bible, out of his love for Jesus, he really loves Jesus as a Muslim. And he makes it clear that Jesus was a Muslim. Now let's bring him on to explain this. My next guest, Mufti Ibn Farooq. Salam alaikum, peace be with you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Pleasure to see you again, Eddie. Good to see you too. How you been? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. All praises to Allah. I'm doing good. So you heard me uh, in the opening. Is there something uh, that I missed? Is this correct regarding uh, Jesus, Isa alayhi salam, for our no, not yet Muslim audience? Well, what you said is exactly correct. We as Muslims, we believe that the word Muslim comes from the word aslama meaning to submit. And we believe Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him, was a true prophet, uh, a, a great man who submitted his will to that of his God, as he says in the Bible. He did the will of the Father, meaning the God that is referred to in the Bible. So he was somebody who was a Muslim in action. He did the bidding, the work, the, the will of the Creator, submitting himself as a Muslim. And we in the Qur'an, we believe all of the prophets, all the way from Adam till the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon all of them, they were all Muslims because they all submitted their own will to that of their Creator. And they brought that message of the Creator, the same message. We believe it's always been one message. Believe in God, don't worship idols, don't worship anybody except God, follow the Prophet of your time. If we as Muslims were there in the time of Jesus, we would be those disciples that would be standing right next to him. If we were in the time of Moses, we would be with him. If we were in the time of Abraham, we'd be with him. As we are in the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon all of them. So help us understand better for the uh, not Muslim audience out there. So because you got so many religions, it wasn't like, okay, in this time, <coughs> excuse me, you had one religion being brought, for instance, Christianity, and then another religion, Judaism, and then another religion, Hinduism. And this century, now we're going to have uh, Buddhism. Was it something like that? No, because if you look at all of the isms that you've mentioned, they were started by the name of somebody. For example, Christianity is named after Christ. So before Jesus Christ, peace and blessings be upon him, there was no such thing as Christianity. There is no historic record that mentions Christianity before Jesus. Peace and blessings be upon him. If you look at Judaism, named after Judah, Confucianism or Buddhism, all of these isms are named. But in Islam, you will notice it's not named after anybody. We, we're not Muhammadans. We are Muslim. And as the Quran talks about Abraham, peace and blessings be upon him. And as you will notice and the audience will notice when I mention any of these prophets, I, out of respect, say peace and blessings be upon them. That's how much Muslims love them. 
you'll never see a Muslim disrespect Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him, or Moses, peace and blessings be upon him. You will never see a Muslim making caricatures or drawings or doing anything else to hurt the image of these great prophets. We love them and we follow them. We believe in them equally. The Quran tells us that our belief in them is equal, meaning that if we reject one, it is as if we rejected all of them. So those prophets, they didn't bring a religion to name after themselves. Jesus never told people, peace and blessings be upon him, be a Christian. Right? We challenge Christians to bring us any verse in the Bible or historic record where Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him, tells his followers, be Christians. No, he tells them, worship the one true God. The same message that we find in the Quran to worship the one true creator. And that's why the word Muslim is in the Quran. We see that even Ibrahim, Abraham, peace and blessings be upon him, he would call his nation Muslims because that is the ones that submitted their will. We don't believe that there's these prophets started new religions. We don't believe the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, started Islam. There's a misconception people put. Islam started in the 6th century with the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. No. Islam has always been the religion from the time of Adam till the day of judgment. The true religion of the one true creator has always been Islam. And that's why if you look at the Ten Commandments, the first commandment is here, O Israel, your Lord is one. The second commandment, don't worship idols. This is what we find in the Quran. Qul Allahu ahad. Allah, say Allah is one. The same message you find. The, the people who deviated from this message People like Paul and those who follow the Pauline doctrine and others, Council of Nicaea, giving divinity to Jesus and so on. Peace and blessings be upon him. These are the people that spun off the true one message and made their own religions. And that's why we see such vast differences between the Judaism of today and what Moses, peace and blessings be upon him, followed. If you look at Orthodox Jews today and you even look at their dress and you look at their forms of worship, you will find things that you don't find in the Torah. You will not find it in the practice of Moses or David, peace be upon them, as the great prophets that they were. You look at Christians today. I mean, I know you come from a background where you know Christianity. Well, most of the practices we see in church are not found in the actual practice of Jesus, peace be upon him. How did Jesus pray? We found that he prayed standing. He prayed bowing. He prayed with his head to the ground. In the Bible, till today, even with all the corruptions and changes, you will find that he put his head his face on the ground and prayed to God. That's how you see Muslims praying. That's how the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, showed us. But if you go to churches today, you see somebody kneeling and dancing and singing and jumping and doing backflips and all kinds of insanity. You see Orthodox Jews that take live chickens and put them over their head. You can YouTube the videos, you can see them. I found myself in an interesting gathering in Brooklyn this week. One involving lots of chicken swinging. Everyone was swinging them. Older men. Younger women. Older couples. Younger couples expecting a baby. Parents wave them above their children. These are not practices that were the practice of those actual prophets. These are all what we call innovations. People mm -hmm. innovated these ways. Look at Christmas, right? Where's Christmas in the Bible? Where's the 25th of December? Where's Christmas? Where, where are trees? Where are gifts? Where, where are Santa Claus coming down your chimney and all these kinds of eggnog and all this? These are all just deviations. This is based off Saturnalia, which was a pagan festival. And you can look this up yourself. These pagan festivals were brought in to change the true religion of Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him, to accommodate the Nordic uh, pagans of Europe. In Islam, we don't believe in that. We believe in staying true to the message that was revealed as it was revealed. Till today, uh, for our non-Muslim or future Muslims or not yet Muslim audiences, go to a mosque anywhere in the world and you will see the prayer being done like the Prophet showed us. Peace and blessings be upon him. You go get a Quran anywhere from China to America you open up, the first chapter will be Al-Fatiha, the last chapter will be An-Nas, it will have 114 chapters, 30 sections, everywhere. All Muslims, even different sects, we'll find the same Quran. But today, if you go to a Catholic church, and you pick up a Catholic Bible, you will find different numbers of chapters. 
you'll find Tobit and things that you will not find in the King James Version. If you find the new revised editions, if you look at the new world translation, if you look at any of these, you will find different verses. And, you know, on the One Message Foundation channel, we have many videos where we show Christians these differences. And there are no responses except that they chose what they wanted. King James and the council that he set up, they set up their own translation and their own collection. The East, Eastern Orthodox Church, the Roman uh, Catholic Church, the, the Ethiopian Bible, the, they all have differences. The Greek Orthodox Bible. And I have a video where I describe all these and I show all these. In the Islam, we believe in sticking to that one true message that was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the same God, the same creator that revealed his message to Jesus, <clears throat> to Moses, to Abraham, peace and blessings be upon all of them. You mentioned Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. We know he's the last and final messenger sent to mankind. But when you bring this up to certain people, to let's say the Christians, some of them, and how would you answer this? They try to compare him to like a Joseph Smith and the Mormons who they reject. They say, oh, this is just another sect, just sure. like we have the Mormons. Have you heard this argument? Hey, baby, are you an angel? Because I'm allergic to feathers. <laughs> you know how to get them. <laughs> Hey baby, did you just fart because you blew me away? I know that one. <laughs> no matter what technology the church comes out with, they can never beat the power of the knock. What is a celestial girl like you doing in a terrestrial place like this? <laughs> That's a good one. You ready for BYU? BYU, I do. I have, I have. We, yeah. we, we, hear, we hear all kinds of uh, interesting Interesting. Brought up and so on. How do you like um, to answer that? Sure. So the first foremost thing is, if we look at uh, the Mormon Church and and what was developed there and so on, uh, and other sects that you have in Christianity and false prophets and things, we show a distinction between that and the Prophet Muhammad peace and blessings be upon him in the first and foremost the Quran, the Book of Mormon. And again, with no disrespect to Mormons, I have it. I've read it. I've gone through it you will find many things that uh, are not in accordance to what modern science has found today. Uh, you will find many things that would be, uh, I would say, racially uh, unacceptable for us to state today. And I don't want to go too deep unless you want to go down that rabbit hole. No, um, but, but you can look at the writings of Bingham Young and you can write about the mark of Cain and uh, how black skin was a, a curse brought and things like this. That today, if you really want to discuss um, you know, you couldn't say these would be the true teachings of a true prophet, right? You don't find any actual historically verified miracles. You don't find any scientific facts that scientists, uh, Joseph Smith could not have known at the time and scientists found out later. We find all those miracles in the life of the prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. First and foremost, sign that shows that he was a true prophet is the Quran itself. We challenge Christians and say, look, tell us this. How can a man in the desert who doesn't know how to read or write, according to the historians across the board from Ibn Ishaq, Ibn Hisham, and you go back to the scholars, uh, Muslims and Orientalists, you will find that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was illiterate, unlettered, couldn't read or write. How could he then write a book that was so eloquent that none of the poets of Arabia could answer that? None of them could bring anything like it. And they tried. I have a series on the life of the prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. And we show evidences, historic evidences of those poets that tried and failed to show that nobody could bring a literate, literally work that would had such balagha, excellence in speech, right? Not just that. The Quran talks about the sun and the moon and the planetary bodies being in an orbit. You know, till very recently, scientists were, were saying that the sun doesn't have an orbit. I mean, the sun... And very recently they said, you know, it does. It's a very slow orbit, but it does have an orbit. How could a man in a desert who didn't know astronomy, who didn't have access to the works of the Greeks and the Romans and all of this, even the Greeks and Romans didn't know these things. How could he have known that? Okay, somebody could say maybe he guessed at it. Okay, no problem. You guess once, you get it right, I got it. But then you have multiple miracles like that, scientific facts, how salt water and sea water touch but don't mix, how mountains have pegs that go on the ground, things that he wasn't a geologist. He didn't, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, we don't have any evidence that he ever went to a place that had salt water. 
Hmm. So what was around him? It was all sweet water. So how would he know there's waves under the ocean? How would he know these things? How could he guess every time and get it right? Not just that, they're historic prophecies. You see, like, like, like when you put all of these together, it becomes a numeric fact that this could not have been without divine intervention. And, and I'll, I'll explain this. So there's scientific miracles. Then there are linguistic miracles, balagha, and as we talked about. Then there are prophecies about the Romans and Persians and battles and who would win that came true. Even if you look at the prophecies of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be him, that are not in the Quran, in Hadith, where he talked about the, the, the victory of Constantinople. Today we call it Istanbul, right? How would he have known that? The victories over the Persians. How would he have known that? At a time where he didn't even control the Arabian Peninsula. At the time in Khandaq, when the, all the different Arab tribes were attacking Medina, there, there was the fear that the Muslims would be genocided to be finished by the Arabian tribes. He was telling them, we will have constant. He was prophesizing these things. And those came true one after the other, every one of them. How do you guess every time and get it right? And then there are physical miracles. And I have a video especially about this. And I think me and you spoke about this before, about the splitting of the moon. Mm -hmm. right? Today, if we go, to, I mean, amongst the Mormon church, they still have prophets. They have people that they call prophets, right? And there are many other uh, Christian denominations that have prophets. I will, I will challenge any one of them. Come meet me in San Diego. And we'll go out on a, on a clear night. And I'll point at the moon. And I'll ask them, split the moon for me. Right? Can they do it? I don't think so, right? The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, during his lifetime, the, the mushrikeen, the, the, the polytheists of Mecca, they told him, show us a miracle. He said, what do you want? They said, split the moon. And this is in the Quran, in Surah Qamar, in the first ayah. And he, he pointed, and Allah made it that the moon split. Now again, this sounds like a, a very wild claim, I understand. But we will bring extraordinary evidence for this, Right? We're not just saying it's in the Quran, so we believe it. No, like for example, Moses split the ocean. Okay, we believe it, but if we ask Jews to show historic evidence, we don't have it. No. Right? If you talk about Jesus walking on water, if you talk about first-hand reports that can be verified through chains of narration, you don't have it. it. Right? In Islam, we will show that the people who were eyewitnesses, Abdullah ibn Abbas. Uh, Anas ibn Malik, who were from different cities. Abdullah ibn Abbas, he was in Mecca. Anas ibn Malik, at this time, he was in Medina. Now, each one of these eyewitnesses, we can give you their historic profile, meaning we can tell you what was their name, their father's name, their mother's name, their children, how was their memory, where they lived, where were they born, where did they die, how good was their precision of reporting, we call Dab and Adal, all of this, right? Not just that. Who did they share this information with? Who were the ones that reported from them? Who wrote it down? Who were the scholars of hadith? Not just that. These are from not just the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, but even the enemies of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now imagine, Eddie, if I'm in Balboa Park and I'm having a debate and I tell guys, hey, you know what? I can split the moon, right? Or I can split the sun, okay? Maybe the people on my side, I hope not, but maybe some of them will back me just because it's a partisan thing, right? But my enemies who are debating against me, no way. They're going to be like, we got him. Finally, we got him. You know, he didn't do it. We didn't see it. Right? They, they would make a big fuss out of it. The enemies of the Prophet, peace be upon him, who were the polytheist idol worshippers of Mecca, they admitted that, yes, this happened. Now imagine that. Nobody from that historical time denied it. Right? It's in the Quran, meaning it was recited in front of the polytheists for years after that, none of them said, no, we were in Mecca and it didn't happen. We challenged Christians, atheists, Jews, Hindus, whoever else, to bring us one single report of anybody from that time period, whether he was a mushrik, a polytheist or not, that said, no, I was in Mecca and this did not happen. We will bring multiple reports from Abu Sufyan, who was not Muslim at that time, from uh, Abu Jahl and Walid ibn Mughayra and others who, who never became Muslim that died as enemies of Islam, but they still admitted, yes, this did happen. So how does a, a false prophet bring something like this? 
Mm -hmm. Just yeah, and you have the the Mormon prophets. They're making predictions of the end of times is going to come, but then right. the, that date comes and passes. You don't have these things with Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessed be upon him. I what he recently, said. Recently, uh, I just recently had a debate with a uh, Korean Jesus believing sect. <laughs> uh, it's a Christian group out of Korea that believes that Jesus came back as a Korean man, wow. uh, and and uh, and he's dead. He came and died. And his wife is now God. They call her Mother God, mm -hmm. um, and and they they believe that you know he was a he was Jesus, and they had given a time that the world would end, and that time passed, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and the world didn't end. That's it. Discredited. It. Discredited, right? And and they have all these kinds of things, but people sometimes want to blindly follow something. Mm -hmm. We in Islam, we don't blindly follow. We have clear evidences on what we follow. So you mentioned the miracles from the Quran, the splitting of the moon. That's just one. You have prophecies you talk about. So sure. we, we often talk about the miracles or Christians talk about, which we believe many of the miracles that Jesus did, peace and blessings be upon him. But you can't go ahead and prove that to an atheist or anybody like what you said, a chain of True. narrators and whatnot. But you also have and you touch upon this in your history in the life of prophet muhammad just touch upon this uh, just slightly again there are tremendous so we talk about the quran which is the living miracle for anyone who's sincere humble open-minded they look at it they will come to know that this there's no way this can come from anyone other than the, the creator of the heavens and earth but you also have so how many how many did you mention like over a thousand miracles three thousand we have three, three thousand reports meaning each report may okay. not be a particular miracle by itself, but there's 3,000 that I mentioned, um, narrations that mention different miracles that happened during the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon And people him. witnessed it. This is not like yes. uh, one person, two. You can have how many people are witnessing these things Excellent. happen. So, so these reports, once again, they are not uh, ambiguous reports. They have to be what we call uh, muttasil, connected chains meaning that the person who physically saw it or heard it and so on will have to be known. We have to know who he is, where he lived. We know how was his memory, how was his moral character. And then everybody that he mentioned this to, we check each one of them. And we have for some of them 70, 80 different people who witnessed these, who told 70, 80, 100 wow, different people. Power. And who told 50, 60, 100 different people. And then we check the biography, each one of them. If any one of them has a weakness in memory, if any of them has a weakness in their moral character, we don't accept that report. That's a da'if. It's a weak report. Right? So we have sahih, authentic, mutawatir, numerous chains. Let, let me give you an example, Eddie. Um, yes. you, me and you are both from the U.S., even though I'm currently outside the U.S., but... Uh, we believe that there was a man named George Washington, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, me and you would agree, right? And your viewers would probably agree as well. And we believe that he had, uh, you know, a, a revolution against the British who were ruling and so on and so on. And he was at this battle and that battle. But did you ever stop to think, like, who was the eyewitness to any of this? Right? We just believe it because in our history textbooks. But... Who is the eyewitness that saw George Washington? What's their name? And who did they tell this information to that I saw George Washington at this battle leading this way or in a Gettysburg address? Or if you look at even later in history, if you look at things like, uh, you know, Abraham Lincoln, the speeches he gave, we don't have a YouTube video of it. We don't have a Facebook uh, live uh, of it. How do we know these things actually happen? Well, we say, you know, it's in a history book. Mm -hmm. But as Muslims, we don't just go by that. We have a system of jarh wa ta'adil. And I'm going to translate all these terms. Jarh means criticizing and ta'adil meaning accrediting, where we go and check each narrator that mentions the report. So if somebody says, I saw the Prophet, peace be upon him, and water came out of his hand because we were in a battle, and this is actually an incident that happened, we don't just accept it because we're Muslim and it sounds good. No, we say, no, no, no. We want to be fair and just. We want to be honest. We say, okay, who was the one that physically saw it? His, we say in Arabic, like he used his senses. And who else saw it? We don't, if it's just one, this is called a gharib hadith, right? We say, okay, who else saw it? And how many reports do we have? Okay, who did they give this information to? How does that information reach us? How can we know that nobody exaggerated, that nobody 
cut anything out or added anything, right? And then we go through each report and each chain and know which scholar of hadith wrote it and how many different scholars wrote it. And we check each biography. And when we find something that is mutawatir, so many chains that numerically it cannot be that they came together on a lie or a mistake, then we call this ilmul yaqini. This is sure knowledge. That sure, we can definitely believe in this which is a greater level of verification than any history book that you have today. I what, challenge historians on this. Wow, this is amazing. So you mentioned one of those miracles was water coming from his, from Prophet Muhammad, yes. peace was upon his hands. Yes. Witnessed, and, and this, witnessed and, by witnessed that, that, that numerous, many, numerous people. Numerous. And, and I, like I said, I have a series that goes over the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And uh, it's on the Majd Ribad channel and on the One Message Foundation channel. In that, I give the references to the books. So if you want to know which book, which volume, which page number, I give references to all of those. And as I mentioned, in when I was collecting my notes for these, this series, there, there were around 3,000 reports, meaning hadith. Some of them, 30, 40 hadith, just about one incident. Some mm -hmm. of them, there's 100 hadith, about one incident. But 3,000 different reports about different miracles throughout the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And these are verified. There mm -hmm. is an excellent book called Dalal al nabuwa of Al-Bayhaqi. Uh, and there is a, a muhtasir, a summarized one of that, uh, that Sheikh Muqbil did. It's a very, very good book. It's Sahim in Dalal al nabuwa uh, You know, you can get it. But this is just one book that goes over many of the true uh, miracles of the life of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And when we comb through the books of history, we find many Orientalists, non-Muslims, that have had to admit that these miracles were such that they could not be faked. They could not be uh, a trick because so many different people saw it at so many different times. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we hear, oh, in Mexico, there was a, 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 a statue of the Virgin Mary and it was bleeding. And yeah. you hear this report goes all out. And then they're like, yeah, we found there were pipes in the bottom. You know? mm -hmm. uh, and then everybody wants to ignore those, you know. Somebody finds, oh, they were eating uh, the, the bread and then they tested it and it was flesh. And they were like, nah, actually those are enzymes and that's why they tested it. You, you know, these kind of things. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the, the, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his miracles, they were such that you could not fake it. You can't fake splitting of the moon. This is not a magic trick. And if you did, you could only fake it to the people that were around you. Like, like if a great magician here does a trick and he makes a, a plane disappear, it's it's trick for those that are around him. Now the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, during his time, when the moon split, the people of Quraysh, his tribe, the people of Mecca, the polytheists, they wanted to challenge that. So what they did, and this is in a book called Al Bidayah wa Nihayah of Ibn Kathir, they did is they asked the people that were outside of Mecca, the Bedouin tribes and others, travelers who were you know on caravan, they said, Hey, did you guys see it? And they said, Yes, we saw it. And people like Anas ibn Malik, who at that time would have been in Medina, in a different city, he saw it. And we have historic evidence. And I can give you the references in the video that I have about the splitting of the moon. If you put my name, Atwal ibn Farooq, moon splitting, you'll find all of the evidences. We have evidences from India, from Mauritius. Again, as I said, we have a science of checking that is very stringent. Like if we find any disparity in reports, we reject. We say there is ittarab uh, and so on. So those reports cannot match our standards, but the historic reports out of India, that there were kings in India that saw the splitting of the moon. And later when they met the Muslims, they accepted Islam saying, we saw this miracle and built a mosque that is still standing today in India. These, these have oral reports. There are written reports in Arabic and in, in, in Portuguese and Spanish and, and, and British uh, historians. They, 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 they compiled these reports. In India, it is such a well-known fact. It is such a well-known history for them that even the Prime Minister of India, Mr. Modi, uh, when he was trying to build trade relations with Saudi Arabia, he had a gold, a small model of that mosque made. And he said, this is the mosque that was made by the Hindu king that saw the splitting of the moon and became a Muslim. And he gave it as a gift to the king of Saudi Arabia. I have screenshots of his tweets where he mentions this. Uh, uh, enemy of Islam. I mean, if you look at Modi and his policies, they have been very critical against Muslims. Somebody who is a right-wing Hindu extremist, BJP party, even he 
is a testimony to the fact that the king of India saw this putting in the moon. He admits this. This is a part of their history. Huh. So now, how could you not know? How could you not believe in a miracle that was seen even by non-Muslims that didn't even know who the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was at that time? Mm -hmm. Until later, when they were told by the Arab uh, who went to trade, when they heard from Malik ibn Dinar and others about what Islam is, then they became Muslims. They built mosques, and we still have them. Mm -hmm. This is uh, amazing. And this is uh, a lot of the things from the Sirah, the life of Prophet Muhammad, those 3,000 you mentioned. This is like, as they say, the appetizers, because you have the Quran, which is the living miracle, and then this on top of it. So anybody, again, who's sincere, who wants to know, who's asking the creator of the heavens and earth for guidance, and they look at this, they, God willing, inshallah, they'll find that this is indeed the truth from the creator of the heavens and earth. I want to touch upon this video here. I thought about because there's also a lot of end of times um, statements from Prophet Muhammad. One of them, which talks about, and maybe you can go ahead and bring some of these about murder. There would be so much murder that the person wouldn't know what he's even murdered for. So I s saw this and I wanted to get your thoughts on this because it kind of goes back and how you can link it possibly to this prophecy that Prophet Muhammad is talking about the rise of murder towards the end of time. A store owner says his heart is with his employees after a shooting at a subway on Northside Drive. The owner says one of his employees is dead. Well-rounded young ladies, really hard workers. Everybody loved them. The owner says the woman just started a few weeks ago. He says another employee is injured and says one of the employee's sons was inside witnessing everything where well, we had an employee i mean a customer that came in mm -hmm. that was uh, a little upset about how his sandwich was fixed believe it or not it was over too much mayonnaise on his sandwich that's when he says oh hell broke loose he says the man started shooting and the store manager shot back when police arrived the owner says they made an arrest but he's not sure who it was we're still working to get more information on what happened from police as for the shooter, the owner says they've seen him before. He's a previous customer, but there haven't been any issues in the past. Too much mayonnaise. Too much mayonnaise. That's insane. Um, and this is one of, there are many signs of the day of judgment that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, uh, told us about that are coming through in front of our eyes. Uh, and no doubt, uh, this is one of them, that killing will become wild, 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 uh, widespread and fornication. I mean, if you look at uh, fornication, unmarried people having casual sex. This is something that historically was not at this level. Even if you look in Europe, if you look in America, uh, maybe let's not even go too far back. Like if you go to the 50s and 40s and so on, you didn't find this to be common where people just go and have casual sex with anybody and everybody. Um, you know, you had, you know, even like why, why do brides wear white in America? And this because there was a sign of her being a virgin and so on. These concepts were there in Europe and in America till very recently. And now you see uh, these murders and, and, and mass shootings and school shootings. And, you know, these are all signs of the day of judgment coming true in front of our eyes. Mm -hmm. If we look at a lot of these, you know, especially in America, we see these school shootings. You know, these kids walk in with, you know, whatever ARs or I mean, it doesn't even matter. It could be with a, with, with a hammer or a knife or whatever. And they kill people at random and they have no reason to kill that person. I mean, it's not even like a sandwich. I mean, absolutely, this child or this kid or this teacher personally did not do anything. Even if that child was bullied, it wasn't that kid. So he's killing him for no reason. And that kid has no idea why this kid is shooting at him. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and I mean, I'm not here blaming this on guns. This is, this is really a, a breakdown of society. That, that's the issue that we're dealing with. I mean, we have guns in other countries, is, you know, but people aren't walking around into schools and shooting it up right something is wrong these these signs and, and let me tell you a couple more i mean if you look at some of the signs of the day of judgment that the prophet peace be upon him told us about that are historically verified one of them is the conquest of jerusalem mm. right how could have the prophet muhammad peace be upon him have known that now imagine if the prophet muhammad peace be upon him said that the muslims will conquer the north pole or something right <laughs> And then it didn't happen. Every Christian would be like, ah, see, it didn't happen, right? But, but look at every place the Prophet, peace be upon him, said would be conquered by Muslims, it happened. Constantinople, Jerusalem, the Persian Empire, so on. You look at it. 
it one after the other they all came true uh, they all they happened. all came they all came true it wasn't like maybe five out of five no a hundred out of a hundred I mean every single one of them there is the major fire that would happen in Hijaz for example this was one of the signs of the day of judgment that Imam al Nabi said came true in his time and he documented when it happened where it happened how how the uh, how the fire was described in the hadith and how it happened during his time uh, this is done I mean, the widespread uh, use of usury or riba, you know, interest-based banking. This is something the Prophet ﷺ prophesized, and this wasn't common before. And now you see it, it has happened, the drinking of alcohol, musical instruments. Um, one of the signs that I, I, I find scary and amazing is something that came through during me and you's lifetime, which is the shepherds and Bedouins competing in building tall buildings. You know, uh, one of the places I studied Islam was in the UAE, and, and, and there was a city called Ras al Khaimah, beautiful city in a beautiful country. I had a really good time, um, and I used to study with one of the scholars in his house. Uh, in that city, there was a young man, and he told the story about his father. The father had passed away at that time, uh, but his father was illiterate. He never learned how to read or write. He owned a good amount of land in Ras al Khaimah. And uh, once the economic boom of oil and happened in UAE um, and they developed the country of UAE and so on, um, they built buildings on his land. So he personally loved the Bedouin lifestyle. He couldn't read or write, didn't want to go back to school. He, they had a mansion, but he would put a tent outside and he would sleep in the tent. He enjoyed that lifestyle. And he didn't like cars, so he would, he would, he would go around the city in a donkey. That was what he was used to. So he was he owned buildings, tall buildings, but he couldn't read or write. He was an illiterate Bedouin with a flock of sheep. But, you know, Allah gave him that wealth, so he, he built buildings. And he would go to these buildings and he would collect the rent. And he couldn't read or write. So he would just tell them, Billah alayk, yani, <laughs> swear by Allah, this is the correct rent. And they would say yes. And he would be like, okay. <laughs> hmm. And this is one of the signs of the Day of Judgment, that the illiterate Bedouin shepherds would be competing in building tall buildings. Today, I believe seven of the ten, and you know, it fluctuates sometimes with new buildings, of the tallest buildings in the world are in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Those people who for a generation ago were Bedouins now are competing literally in trying to build one mile into the sky. This is uh, truly amazing. I was watching a documentary the other day. It was called the, everyone was recommending it. It was called the, what is a woman? And they had one part. It was there in California. I think that's where you're from. And yeah. I, wanted, I wanted to ask you because they had it blurred out, but they actually had men, naked men walking in the street. Is this really happening in California? I mean, um... Fortunately, I'm from San Diego, and yeah. San Diego is not as uh, bad as other parts of California. Um, we don't have something like this that, that I have seen in San Diego mm -hmm. personally, but there are areas in California where definitely this is going on. Isn't that against the law, indecent exposure? Or has, uh, the, law, has the law been it, changed? <laughs> I, you know, to be honest with you, I don't even know the law is anymore, right? Yeah. I mean, now they have a law in some parts of California that if you shoplift under a thousand dollars, they can't arrest you. So you got people walking out with five hundred dollars, six hundred dollars worth of stuff, and the police is giving them tickets. Um, I, I mean, doing drugs, I thought was against the law, but now if you go to certain parts of California, you will see people smoking meth or heroin or marijuana like it's nothing. Like weed is not even a thing anymore. Like. Like, you know, like back in my days, or I don't know, I mean, I'm sure in your days in high school, that was like a rebellious thing, like, oh, he's smoking weed, you know? Mm -hmm. Now teachers are like, want to hit? You know? In the classroom. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's legal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? I mean, you know, so what's the issue I hear what now, you're right? saying, yeah. But, but, but now it's become worse. Now you see people doing heroin like it's nothing. You see people smoking meth. You see, uh, I mean, now the, it's become to such a level that, I don't even know what the law is anymore. Like, I don't even know what, what do we enforce? I, I mean, the homeless population has become such a problem in California and, and around the world, and, and especially in the U.S. Uh, I don't know what we're going to do as a country because now you have a person who just set up a, a tent in the middle of a street. I mean, that's illegal, right? Because it's a walkway. 
and then 30, 40 other tents will be put up and then they'll have their own little society. They'll, they'll be sitting there in broad daylight doing all kinds of drugs. Um, you know, police walks by and doesn't do anything. You know, let me ask you something. You heard about the Chapel Hill, uh, what happened in uh, Chapel Hill where they, it's called Chaz or the, or the free zone that they took over mm-hmm. where some people, you know, whether they were Antifa or not, I'm, yeah. I'm not going to get into the politics of it, but they, there were like four city blocks or something like that that they, with weapons, took over and made it an autonomous zone for a while, right? And the police had to leave. The mayor said to the police, leave. I want to do a social experiment. Eddie, if you're ready, I'm ready. Right? Me and you, and we're going to bring a bunch of our Muslim brothers with beards and turbans and shimars, and we're going to get AK-47s, and let us take over a few blocks and say, you can't enter. <laughs> Let's see how long that lasts. You know, the racism or the double standards will come out real quick with that mm-hmm. one, right? Yeah. But that's why I said, I don't know what, I don't know what the law I mean, today, if, if a group of protesters takes over a block and says the police can't enter, but they're of a certain you know, whatever demographic, then that's okay. Uh, you know, if I want to self-identify as a woman uh, today and walk into a bathroom, you know, uh, you're going to have security called on me. Why? But somebody else does it, then it's okay. I don't know. Mm-hmm. It's a strange world we live in. Uh, but, you know, one, one thing I'll say you know, about the signs of the day of judgment, something that hit me the other day, well, I was talking to my neighbor, and we're talking about yoga pants. And as Muslim women, obviously, alhamdulillah, they cover when they go outside and so on. Um, but a lot of women have this thing now today where they walk around in the street wearing what they're called yoga pants, which are really, really skin tight. I mean, again, if you wear it in the privacy of your home or when you're working out in a place where there's only women, and that's a different issue. But if you're walking on the street, you know, this is what, something strange because... But what if you still have, what if you still have the top part, the hijab? Yeah, I, I think people misunderstand what the word hijab means. Hijab doesn't mean cover your head. Hijab means to conceal. So if you have a little scarf on with yoga pants, you're not concealing much. Mm-hmm. Uh, and my neighbor, who's not Muslim, he told me, you know, I don't like these yoga pants. And I was like, why? He said, because it doesn't leave much to the imagination. Wow. And immediately, immediately the hadith of the Prophet, peace be upon him, came to me. The prophecy. About the, sign of the prophecy of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon another him. Another miracle. Judgment, another miracle. Another miracle. Wow. That women would be covered, but be naked. Mm-hmm. And this is what we see today. These this could not have been known by the companion of the Prophet, peace be upon him. The early generations of Muslims could not have imagined that there would be clothing that is so tight that if you get a goosebump, it shows. And, and that's what we're seeing in our time, this prophecy coming true let, in let, front of our eyes. Let me ask you this. Is it a far stretch? You know, you know the, where God Almighty Allah is talking about when the female baby, when she is brought back and asked for what crime was she murdered, Today, there's a big debate, you know, now with the overturning of the abortion with the road. What's the, so you've you've been, have you followed this? Have you kind of up to speed? Uh, You know, for, for let's say a child or a, a baby who sex is now determined in the womb, can you, is it a long stretch to go ahead now and to connect it where, because you have even some Muslims now in this state who are confused, or maybe they have some leaders also who are, you know, promoting this. My daughter today texted me, she's in Minneapolis, she's 19. And she said, mom, is, there, is this it? Is this it? Is there nothing that can be done? I cried after I read that text message, and it's hard for me to admit that because I don't like telling people I cry. But I sat there recognizing that for 13 states in the United States, that after 30 days, this is it. And for another 13, it's going to also be it. And it could be it for 50 if we do not act. And how, what's the Islamic position regarding abortion? Because this is an area where you can say that Christians and Muslims 
there is a common understanding on this, the fight for, for human, for life. The size of a 20 week baby is the size of the length of my hand from the head to the rump, not including the feet. The average baby at this gestation will weigh 500 grams. The suction machine will remove from around the baby the pale yellow amniotic fluid that has been surrounding and protecting the baby. Now with babies this big, they won't fit through a suction catheter. The baby's bones and skull are quite strong. They cannot be torn apart by the suction alone. The instrument used to carry out the termination of pregnancy is a forceps, a grasping forceps. It is a metal high quality instrument, uh, 13 inches or so in length. The active end of the instrument is about two and a half inches in length and it has teeth within the instrument which when it grasps a structure will not let it go easily. The abortionist uses this clamp to grasp an arm or a leg. Once he has a firm grip, the abortionist pulls hard in order to tear the limb from the body of the baby. One by one, the rest of the limbs are removed, along with other body organs, the intestines, the spine, the heart and the lungs. Usually the most difficult part of the procedure is extracting the baby's head, because at this stage of pregnancy, the baby's head will be the size of an average plum. It simply won't come through the cervix. In order that this is removed, one needs to crush the skull. This requires inserting the grasping forceps and placing it around the head and crushing the baby's head. That will of course cause damage and injury to the skull bones. And one will know that one has achieved that by observing a yellowish creamy fluid moving through the cervix that will be the brains of the baby. The abortionist then will collect the various parts of the body and reassemble them to check that there are two arms, two legs and so on. Once all the parts have been accounted for the abortion procedure is complete. For the woman this procedure carries significant risks. Major complications can occur including perforation of the uterus or laceration of the cervix with possible damage to the bladder, the bowel and other maternal organs. Infection and hemorrhage can also occur and is not rare. These complications can lead to massive hemorrhage, septicemia and include death. Future pregnancies are also a greater risk for loss because of premature delivery due to abortion-related trauma and injury to the cervix and uterus. What I have described is an operation that will be done from 14 weeks of pregnancy through to 24 weeks of pregnancy. It's very gruesome. The reality of abortion, particularly second trimester, is very gruesome. You have another side, but there's obviously, obviously there's the exceptions, right? You can talk about that. But what's the, the what's the Islamic stance on this abortion? Islam is a religion that is a divine religion, meaning it's a religion that was revealed uh, from the Creator. So we have a, a balance that you don't find in anything man-made, right? So, in essence, human life has to be protected, right? And the child in the womb past the first stage, the first trimester, you could say, and so on, it is alive. There is a beating heart, there is flesh, there is thought, there is a brain. Um, in Islam, we don't believe that it's okay for somebody to murder that child as a form of contraceptive, you know, as a form of, you know what, uh, I, I didn't use whatever protection, so now... I'm going to murder this child. Uh, what fault is it of that child, right? We don't believe that. At the same time, there are certain times, because Islam is a very practical and balanced religion, that there could be an exception to the rule in the sense that maybe the life of the mother is in danger. 
the life of the child and the mother are in danger. There are some pregnancies that we can, uh, you know, professional medical doctors can say that both the child and the mother would be uh, in, in danger of their life if this went forward. And then you would look at how far the pregnancy is and you have a whole system of fiqh in Islam to determine that. One of the calamities of our time is Muslim politicians are not looking at what is right from wrong. They're not looking at moral code. They're not looking at the Quran. They're not looking at the Sunnah. They're not looking at the Sharia. They're not looking at what is the divine message of Islam. They're looking at political alliances. And this is a calamity. And we saw this coming. Early on, when mosques started to have uh, political parties and started to have uh, politicians come and give speeches and they started to have Muslims get involved with Democrats and Republicans in this party and that party, I used to raise the red flag and say, look, you guys are talking about a maslaha, you're talking about a, a need of greater good, but you realize this is going to take you down a path where you're going to become part of that system, where if you are in a certain political party, you're going to have to uh, stand for certain principles just to keep your position in that party. And America is not, and we talk about a, a free country in the sense anybody can become president, but clearly you can't. I mean, if we're being honest, there's two parties. Is the, you've never seen a Green Party or Libertarian or anybody even come close, and not in our lifetime, right? So you have Republicans and Democrats, and these are the two parties that if you're going to have a president, it's going to be one of those two parties. And to get to where you can even get to that platform to be able to run, you have to fall in line with their principles, not your Islamic principles, not your Christian principles, not your Jewish principles, not your... Uh, Buddhist principles, you have to be in line with there. So you will see people who are Christians, who are Catholics, who are Muslims, but because they have a certain letter, whether it's an R or a D, in front of their candidate name, they will sacrifice their religious principles for these uh, political goals. Right? Biden, for example, he's a Catholic. right? And the Catholic Church, according to their doctrine, are against abortion. But Biden, he's pro abortion Why? Because politics. And our Muslim brothers and sisters, may Allah protect us and protect them. Amen. We make dua for them. We're not here to attack people. We're here to uh, I mean, supplicate for them and for their good and to protect our ummah from their mistakes are falling down that same mistake. They are taking political stances, sacrificing the Sharia. And I want to be very clear as a Muslim, we have to live by the Qur'an, what Allah has revealed, in accordance with the way of the Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. And we have to live by that divine code. And if we overturn or try to do away with even a letter, even a single ruling, knowing that this is the ruling from Allah, and we go against it, not that we make a mistake or sin, everybody sins, but we say, no, this haram, this forbidden thing is permissible, or this permissible thing is forbidden, this will take you outside the fold of Islam. This is something that takes you outside the fold of Islam. Allah has forbid killing. Allah says that I have forbidden, for in the Hadith Qudsi, that I have forbidden zulm, oppression, on myself and on you. So don't oppress each other. I, he has forbid us from killing. In the Quran, it tells us killing one soul unjustly is like killing all of mankind. So a five-month-old fetus that is... Of, you know, has teeth and, and all of that, and you abort it for what? For what reason? Oh, I don't feel like I, I'm having a baby today. It was getting, wasn't it getting to the point where it was uh, six months in, seven months in, eight months in, not full term, about to look, and they were still doing this. Yeah, I mean, the, the issue is when we talk about terms and we talk about abortion, even even when we look at the 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 reasons for it, it shocks me. Sometimes there's a well, hold on, my, my, but, the, but the thing is, my body, my choice. Well, well, that's that's interesting when we say that my body, my choice. So, you know, when you have a, you know, five, six month old child in your stomach, what about that child's body and their choice? You know, is that not a human being? You know, this is something amazing to me that and think about this. All these people making these statements. Imagine if their parents had done that. Imagine if me and you, and may Allah protect us all, if my parents had said, you know, my body, my choice, you know, mm. 
Uh, for what? There is no risk to health. There is no... If you think you can't provide for a child, remember, Allah is the one that provides. How many children are born and raised in orphanages and end up becoming millionaires and billionaires? Hmm. You know, Steve Jobs, for example, his dad wasn't there. And they had whatever, and his dad left, didn't raise him. And he was one of the richest men in the world. Right? Many people like this, you will find from very humble beginnings, where even Obama, for example, his dad left, his mother raised him as a single mother, and all of that. He became the president of the United States. So don't think that, oh, I can't afford to have a baby. You're not the one that provides for the baby. Allah writes the risk. Allah is the one that provides the sustenance. If somebody thinks that, oh, I can't afford a baby, then the whole mindset is wrong. Okay? If you ever look at a bird, what happens? They, they go out in the morning from their nest, and they go and search and come back with worms and their stomach is full. Who provides for them? You look at whales and you look at sharks in the ocean. Who provides for them? Allah provides for them. Allah will provide for the child. That's not an issue. But people that murder children that are for many months into it, where they have developed a heartbeat, they have, they have, they have developed uh, limbs, they've developed, this is murder. This is not acceptable in Islam. It's not acceptable in Christianity. It's not acceptable in Judaism. It's not acceptable in anyism. No religion in the world allows this. Mm -hmm. And people who want to go by that, it's not about, I mean, again, I'm not trying to get into the political divide of pro-choice and pro-life and things. This is just basic morality. This is basic Islamic and Christian uh, and Judaism is basic ethical moral code that's in the divine text. We cannot kill children because we just don't feel like having a baby that day. Hmm. And yeah. I want, what were you going to say? I, I, yeah. I just want to, again, once again, uh, as a reminder to my Muslim brothers and sisters, this is not about political lines. I'm not saying Democrats and Republicans. But as a Muslim, we must understand that Allah and his Prophet, والسلام, has forbidden such actions. And as Muslims, we can never go against the Quran and Sunnah. There is a very beautiful hadith, and I will mention this, uh, where a woman came to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and told him, I have fornicated. And, and imagine the, 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 the fate of this woman, that she is coming forward herself. I mean, she's not afraid to take the punishment. And she says, oh, Prophet of Allah, punish me. I have fornicated. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, first he tried to tell her, maybe you have it. And he, and he, because he was so uh, loving and merciful upon the believers, but when she was very explicit about it, he said, okay, go back. Come back when you, are, when you know whether you're pregnant or not. And when she came back and she said, I was pregnant, he told her, it's not that child's fault. Now imagine this. This is a child from fornication, from a sin. But uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, saying, it's not the child's fault. Come back when you've delivered the baby. And when the baby was born, he says, come back when you have breastfed the baby. I mean, uh, imagine even through fornication, the Prophet I'm saying you can't kill this baby. It's not the baby's fault, right? So wow. look at look at the, the abortion debate today in the light of this. How can any Muslim be pro-abortion? Like I said, in Islam, we do have checks and balances. We're not unrealistic like some Christians and others. Uh, we do believe that if the life of the mother or the child is in danger, depending on what, you know, how far developed, and the books of fiqh discuss this in detail, the books of jurisprudence, we do have exceptions because there are times where we have to save a life, right? Whether it's the life of the mother or so on. But when there is no such medical need, when there is no such life-threatening scenario to just use abortion to kill children who are past the first trimester, this is murder. This is where we would say this is unacceptable by the moral code of Islam, and every Muslim has to stand against that, no matter their political alliance. Do you think, uh, before we conclude, just a couple more questions, do you, do you think this is an excuse for a lot of people just to go ahead and continue on that rampant w way that we talked about earlier in the promiscuity, the fornication that's just prevalent. This is just, you know, kind of a, a card that's there available, and now that doors has been closed. You know, this is what's upsetting to a lot of people. I mean, the door is not closed even. I mean, Roe uh, versus Wade being overturned doesn't mean that we're not going to have abortions anymore. People have tried to make it as if abortions banned, but certain late-time abortions are going to be left up to the state, first off. 
So many liberal states are still going to continue. So it's um, still, it's still for people to know, it's, it's just leaving it up to the state to determine then. Exactly. I mean, people yeah. have made this as if like, oh, you know, the government's intruding on your private. It's really not. All, all, I mean, if you really look at the essence of the issue is the Supreme Court has said, look, this is not something the federal government should mandate, that this is a right for people to have abort late term abortions. We're going to leave it up to the states. And I believe the last time, I mean, I'm traveling right now, but last time I checked, only 15 states were going to actually take the uh, stance that you shouldn't have late-term abortions. Mm -hmm. The rest of the states were going to leave it as it is. And that may change. But in the end, uh, I mean, even if you're in one of those states, you could go to the other state and get an abortion. So it's not like uh, people are like as if some great, you know, it's more symbolic really than anything else. But what disturbs me is you have Muslim politicians out there saying that they are pro-abortion, that they are they are pro somebody having a late-term abortion without any medical need, meaning that they want to say that if you just went and had a one-night stand and you didn't take the precautions that you could have to stop from pregnancies happening and then you got pregnant and then you had that early time to stop the pregnancy and you didn't and now you have a child with a heartbeat, flesh, bones, eyes, uh, you know, sometimes teeth and all of that, which develops in later trimesters. And now you want to murder that child because you don't want to give up your lifestyle of, you know, carefree living. Uh, no Muslim can support that. What about a, a statement like no one should be forced to continue a pregnancy? No one should be forced to continue a pregnancy. Right, but, but, but that's an incorrect statement, because in Islam, if there is no threat to the woman's life, even if the child was born of fornication, the Prophet, peace be upon him, told her, you have to continue that pregnancy. So how can you go against something that is clear in a hadith? Mm -hmm. As a Muslim, yeah. it's not acceptable. Or as a Christian, or as a Jew. I mean, no faith that I know of allows such a thing. Nobody that believes in God, in any form or manner, believes in such a thing. Mm-hmm. And that's beautiful. Islam is a complete way of life, the blueprint for life. It has everything there. And one of the most precious things is life. And that life in the womb is a life. So that also is something that one is going to have to be accountable to, to the creator of the heavens and earth on the day of judgment. So we really got to take this serious and not fall into these traps. And I want to thank oh. you very much, very much for uh, spending some time with us. What were you going to say? Uh I appreciate your time, really. Uh, I love your show sure. and Someday. support your show. And, you know, uh, I'll tell you this. Um, we are living in a, in a very strange time and a time where the faith of people is being tested. As Muslims who are watching this show, as future Muslims that are watching this show, um, understand something. People that deviated from their message brought the curse of Allah upon themselves. The people of Lot, if you look in the Bible, if you look in the Quran, if you look in history, they had a message to live a certain way. When they deviated from that, they were destroyed. They brought the punishment of Allah upon themselves. And continuously we find this. When you find those that change the message, that sell out the religion for political gain, for money, for monetary, for, for societal pressures, they destroyed themselves as a nation. And then they destroyed themselves as individuals by dying on a state of kufr and shirk. And may Allah protect us. I mean. the, wife, the wife of Lot, as we find in the Quran, she is called an example of a disbelieving woman. Even though she didn't worship idols. I mean, it's not that she... What did she do? She was from those that turned back. She supported the LGBTQXYZ lifestyle and supported those people against the commandments of God. And because of that support, she's called a kafir on the Quran as a non-believer, right? As somebody who denies and rejects. We as Muslims must not let this happen. We cannot support that which Allah has forbidden clearly in the Quran. The Quran mentions the people of Lot, the clear, authentic narrations from the Prophet, peace be upon him. They mention the curse of Allah is upon those who men who dress like women or women that dress like men, the trans that we are seeing today, the, 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 the condemnation of the act of homosexuality is clear. There is no disagreement amongst Muslim scholars. People like Ibn Hazm and others and Nabawi and Ibn Qudama have documented ijma, consensus of the Muslim scholars that the act of homosexuality is forbidden. 
anybody that says that they're pro LGBTQXYZ or whatever and, 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 and puts forward legislation supporting such actions is taking themselves outside the fold of Islam. No, I'm not making takfir here. I'm saying this, this action is known to be from those that take you outside the fold of Islam to make permissible that which Allah has made haram and to support it and to promote it. Muslims, you cannot sell out the religion for political gain. You will not prosper this way. Help of Allah will not come from you selling out the religion. If you want the help of Allah, if you want the ummah to prosper, we need to stick to the Quran. We need to stick to the Sunnah. We need to go back and look at the way of the Salaf, the earlier generation, the Salaf of this ummah, and stay on their way because they were the ones who were successful. And as non-Muslims, future Muslims, I want you to see that we as Muslims will not sell out our religion. Even if you have one or two here and there, as a Muslim body, as a Muslim nation, we are together in standing firm for our religion. We will not do what the Christians did with Christianity and bring Christmas and, and, and all these innovations. We will not do what the Jews did by changing the laws of usury and so on. We will stick to our true message and we invite you to become Muslims and stand firm with us on that divine message. And just to, to note, uh, if a Christian is following the Bible and a Jew is following his teachings, this is what you're saying is clear there. It's lucidly clear also what you had just mentioned, isn't it? In Christianity and Judaism. If we look in Leviticus. I don't say homosexuality is an abomination, Mr. President. The Bible does. Yes, it does. Leviticus. 18.22. Chapter and verse. It wasn't until I read the Bible cover to cover at age 17 that I discovered the truth of what the Bible really says because a lot of passages don't ever get preached from the pulpit because they're simply not popular. You know, I preach what the Bible says and what the Bible says is not popular. I am not saying that this is something that uh, you know, should be taken as Christian law today. That's up to them to discuss. But uh, from a biblical perspective, in the old... This is in the Bible. This is in the Bible. This is in the Bible that the punishment of homosexuality is... The Bible's again it. God's again it. I'm again it. Sodomy has always been an abomination. Both Old and New Testament has always been, in God's view, punishable by death. Homosexuality was clearly and severely condemned. From the book of Leviticus, chapter 18, verse 22, the word of God says, You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Now, many people will come back and say, oh, that's the Old Testament. Well, as Christians and Jews, you do believe the Old Testament is from God. So that would be applicable. But even if you want to look at the New Testament in Romans, they, they mention a list of those things that will bring death as a punishment. And you shall not pity them. You shall not feel sorry for them. And one of them in the New Testament in Romans is a man laying with a woman as uh, with, with another man as he would lay with a woman, meaning the act of homosexuality. It is forbidden in the New Testament. If you look at the church fathers, if you look at historic writing from rabbis and priests, no doubt that every religion condemned this action. We as people who believe in God have to be able to have the freedom of speech to be able to say what we believe. I believe that marriage is not just a bond, but a sacred bond between a man and a woman. The cancel culture that wants to uh, silence us is against the First Amendment. If somebody has the right <clears throat> to dress up uh, a man, to dress up as a woman in America and walk around and a woman to dress up as a man because they say this is freedom, then how is it that me as a Muslim, I don't have the freedom to say I don't agree with that behavior? How? That's my yeah. question. <laughs> yeah so this is uh this is very important especially we just did some programs on this when it's being pushed on the children when it's being pushed yeah. and now you as a parent you don't have a right to say anything so um you have your and way we have ours at the end of the day and we can cur go ahead uh, uh, currently i'm in i'm in europe and it and, and i would say it's worse here than it is in america mm -hmm. um you know th this this is not something we look at the qom of loot the people of lot uh, whether you're looking at the biblical narrative or the one in the Quran, um, they didn't just stop at doing these actions. They forced it. If you look at the Romans and the Greek and what happened in their, you know, in their spas and whatever they wanted to call them, um, this is not something that's going to 
just be like, okay, let us do what we want. It's going to be forced on people. And it's going on right now. Right now, you don't have the right to say, you know what? I don't want my children being exposed to this until I'm ready to discuss it with them. No, in their kindergartens, in their preschools, in their elementary schools, this is being forced down their throat. By Every narrative is being rewritten now. Every Marvel uh, story movie is being rewritten to bring these things into it. Characters in, in comic books like Loki and others are being rewritten to be shown as whether it's homosexual or bisexual or this or that so that the narrative can change. Uh, history is being rewritten in front of us. People are bringing things that we never saw. Uh, why? Because they want this to be stuffed down our throats. They want children. And, and, the, and, and the sad thing is Muslims or Christians who are church going and Jews who are in their synagogues are starting to fall prey to this, where they're afraid to speak up, where they're afraid to say anything because they will get canceled. What happened to freedom of speech? Is it only when you insult a religion that when, that's when you have freedom of speech? But when we want to defend our faith and say what we believe, and we have the right to believe, a right that Allah gave us, that now we're being told, you're going to get canceled, you're going to get this. You know what? They can cancel whatever they want. We're going to speak the truth. And if enough of us stand together, Christians and Muslims and Jews and believers in God, to stand on what all of us do agree on, that this is a lifestyle that is not acceptable, a killing of late trimester children, for no medical reason is not acceptable then we can stand together thank you very much for being with us may god almighty allah reward you inshallah we can connect again sometime in the future it was a pleasure and uh, it's always a pleasure and look look forward to speaking to you again inshallah I cannot leave without giving you a gift. If you're not yet Muslim and you tune in to see what these Muslims are talking about and you like a free copy of the Quran, go ahead and visit thedeanshow.com. We'll take care of the postage and everything and get it delivered to you. And if you still have some questions about Islam, call us at 1-800-662-4752. We'll see you next time. Until then, peace be with you. Assalamu alaikum. And if you like this episode of The Dean Show, like this video, share this video, far and wide and support us on our patreon page so we can continue this work thank you for tuning in peace be with you assalamu alaikum assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh dear brothers and sisters alhamdulillah i've had the blessing of knowing brother eddie since he started the dean show and he's one of the most sincere and most dedicated people to the da'wah that i have ever met and i'm so happy and pleased to see that they are now moving to the dean center inshallah ta'ala and i have no doubt that bi'idhnillahi ta'ala it will be a successful project insha'Allah. So please do support the Dean Center and continue to support the Dean Show. Jazakumullahu khayran. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.